Saifuddin Adam is currently Professor of International Political Economy at the Graduate School of Global Studies, Doshisha University in Kyoto, Japan. So we've had, I think, three or four who have come on very long trips, and I hope you've recovered somewhat from your jet lag. He has previously taught in Ethiopia, the US, and China. In addition, he has served as a research fellow in Germany. Dr. Adam has published more than a dozen books, including an edited volume, China's Diplomacy in Eastern and Southern Africa and co-authored a volume with Ali Masrui, one of my heroes, I might say. Uh, um, he passed away some years ago. Um, Afrasia is the name of the book, A Tale of Two Continents, University of Press of America, 2013, and Perspectives on Culture and Globalization. So I'd like you to welcome, please, Seyfuddin Anu. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to share one perspective on an important topic. My topic is uh, from Lawrence of Arabia to uh, Wolf Warrior II, uh, Empire Music in Comparative Perspective. I understand that in the program it says the subtitle is a tradition of analysis. I modified it a bit, partly because this seems to be more or rather less abstract than a tradition of analysis. And um, I argue that uh, there is element of continuity uh, in the patterns of imperial uh, discourse. And in the specific context of uh, China, in the Middle East, and uh, Africa, I would seek to demonstrate today that uh, we may be moving from a Eurocentric international system to a sinocentric international system. Uh, before I clarify the concept of Eurocentrism, first, uh, I'd like to mention uh, also that uh, my style of delivery is slightly different from the previous presenter. I mostly read my presentation, and that is the only way I can efficient, efficiently manage my time, and it is also easier for me to do so. Uh, so I start by clarifying the concept of Eurocentrism. And uh, Eurocentrism can be simply defined as looking at the world from a perspective of a European, or from a European perspective. And uh, Eurocentrism has different dimensions. Today, by way of introduction, I uh, will concentrate on two dimensions of Eurocentrism. That is uh, Eurocentrism of geography, and Eurocentrism of uh, time. So uh, who named and positioned the continents and oceans? The answer is, of course, Europe. The term Far East, let me start with the term Far East because I uh, traveled from Japan and arrived here yesterday. So let me start with the Far East. Far East, the term Far East. Far from where? It is, of course, from Europe. This term is becoming, uh, or we could even say, has become uh, politically incorrect. One could also argue that it is also, uh, it is uh, 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 geographically incorrect as well. Maybe there are people here who are more knowledgeable than me about geography, but uh, uh, I am not sure if you can really pinpoint and say this is the center of the planet Earth. So in that sense, the term is inaccurate geographically too. Then uh, you have the term Near East, which has become uh, less useful or has fallen into disuse. Again, the term Near East is near from Europe. That is the reference. The term Middle East is more complicated because the word East is obviously Eurocentric, East from Europe, but the use of the term Middle is objectively defensible. The region which is called the Middle East lies in the middle of the three ancient continents. As I explained shortly, even the word ancient itself is Eurocentric, but for the time being, I will use it here. These ancient continents are, of course, Africa, Asia, and to a lesser extent, Europe. It is the middle by being the crossroads between the three continents. Some people refer to the Middle East as also as West Asia, but of course that uh, type of categorization leaves out Egypt, 
leaves out Sudan, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, uh, and Western, uh, Western Sahara. So uh, for that reason, you know, that is inaccurate technically to call the Middle East, uh, uh, West Asia. So the point is Europe named the continents, Europe named North and South America, Europe and Antarctica, even Africa and Asia have names which also non-European in origin were applied to those land masses first and foremost by Europeans. Europe also named oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific, Arctic, the Mediterranean Sea. Even the Indian Ocean could as well have been called the African Ocean if it was not for Europe's fascination with uh, the sea route to India. Europe also positioned the continent on the map, making sure that Europe is above Africa, making sure that Europe is ab above the Middle East. Otherwise, there, uh, this position is not a reflection of law of gravity, but a convention chosen by Europeans. That is to say that there was no spectator in the universe or in outer space telling people from which position planet Earth was to be viewed. Now, briefly about Africa. Also, Africanist scholarship or African studies has paid greater attention to the artificiality of borders in Africa, borders that were drawn by Europeans. One could argue that the borders of the continent itself was not much less artificial. Take Yemen, which is separated from the African landmass just by 25 kilometers, about 15 miles. Yemen is categorized not as part of Africa, but part of the Middle East, part, part of Arabia. While Madagascar and Mauritius, with respective distance of 500 and 1,000 kilometers from Africa's coastline, qualified as part of Africa. The point is that the separation of the Middle East and Africa is quite arbitrary. Who says that the Red Sea is where Africa ends and Asia or Middle East or Arabia begins. One could probably argue more conv convincingly that the Persian Gulf is where Africa ends and Asia begins. But this could be error, you know, I mean, Europe's error. Even if they were errors, they have been immortalized because of Europe's power. To paraphrase the philosophical saying, the mistake of the powerful acquires some of the prestige of power. Here, one could also, of course, refer to West Indies or American India. In uh, the 15th century, as you know, Columbus sailed across the Atlantic, found some islands, and thought he found India and called them Indies. And uh, the people he called also the people. Indians. But these terminologies have, have stuck. That is what I meant by uh, the, the mistake of the powerful acquired some of the prestige of power. Um, that is, in other words, because Europeans have dominated most branches of science, at least for the last 300 years, many paradigms of all other cultures have been distorted by European perspective. And this is a theme I shall return to later on in the context of china africa relations. But for now, I must ask how much of this Eurocentrism of geography is reversible? The answer is much of Eurocentrism of contemporary geographical knowledge is not reversible. It is beyond repair. However, there is another type of Eurocentrism which can be modified, and this is Eurocentrism of time. So when did the modern period begin? This is usually the kind of question I sometimes start my class. Depend, depending on uh, one's perspective, the answer is somewhere between the 16th and the 19th centuries. Some say it began with the Copernican or scientific revolution. Others say with the French Revolution, others 
uh, maintained that it started with the birth of the nation state in Westphalia and still others uh, link to the beginning of modernity to the Industrial Revolution. That is what we are taught and that is what we teach. But in reality, the realization of history need not be so Eurocentric. The concepts of ancient, medieval, and modern are deeply rooted in European history. Many years ago, I published an article, specifically in 2005, about Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun is a philosopher regarded by many prominent European scholars as the founder of modern sociology. But he was categorized as a pre-modern thinker because of the Eurocentric, because of the Eurocentric periodization of history. So in, um, in my article, which is, by the way, available also on the internet, uh, I tried to roll back this Eurocentrism of time. The title of the article is Decolonizing Modernity. Another version of the title is Ibn Khaldun as a modern thinker. So uh, Ibn Khaldun, by the way, is uh, uh, an individual who was born in what is today called Tunisia. In a, he's an Afro-Muslim thinker. He has theorized about civilizations and so forth. So Eurocentric periodization becomes particularly pro problematic when it is applied to China, which is over 3,000 years of recorded history. In any case, the broader question I wish to raise in my presentation is whether we are moving from a Eurocentric international system to a Sinocentric international system. So let me briefly describe the outline of my presentation. <laughs> nice. So by way of introduction, I used two movies as, yeah, as metaphorical representations to explore with you point by point and from a comparative perspective China's activities in Africa in recent years. The movies are, uh, as already mentioned, Lawrence of Arabia and Wolf. Wolf Warriors too. Also, much of the data is from Africa. The broad generalizations apply to the Middle East as well. That will be followed by comparison of European empire and what I call Chinese empire in the making. On the basis of material which I had previously published and I understand is included in your resource folder, I will then address some of the contradictions in China's diplomacy in Africa, partly to highlight that China's external behavior as a rising power has not yet crystallized. The terms of Sino-African relations are dictated by China, simply because China is stronger than Africa. This means we cannot take what Chinese or African leaders say at face value and for this reason, I would share a set of criteria by which one could assess whether China is as benign or even benevolent power in Africa as it claims to be. I first articulated the ideas in this section in an op-ed published in South China Morning Post last year, which is also, I understand, is included in your resource folder. I will uh, end uh, my presentation with summary and a conclusion. How many of you have seen these movies? Yeah, maybe <laughs> Lawrence. 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 Yes, exactly, yes, yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of you have not seen, you know, both of them, partly because the first one is really a very long movie, as you know, uh, and the second one is relatively new, 2017. One is the story of Lawrence of Arabia, and the other is about what I call the Lawrence of Africa. 
what are the major differences between the two movies? That is what I start with. Number one, The Lawrence of Arabia is a, a 1962 British historical movie. It is about three and a half, no, three hours and a half, or three hours and 30 minutes long, set in Arabia before the First World War. It narrates the personal sacrifice made by an Englishman, T.E. Lawrence, played by Peter O'Toole, to help Arabs defeat the Ottomans. And defeat they did, but only to be dominated and colonized by the British. Officially, therefore, Lawrence, Lawrence's objective was to save Arabs from the Ottomans. But he also contributed to the elimination of a major obstacle at the time to the expansion of British imperialism in the Middle East. Wolf Warrior II is a 2017 Chinese action film. It is two hours long and is partly about saving Africans from US mercenaries. And save they did, but we don't know what will come after that. I mean, in the movie. Number two, The Lawrence of Arabia exhibits the features of what a Kenyan scholar, Ali Mazuri, had called benevolent racism, which involves a sense of racial superiority accompanied by readiness to be of service to the inferior race. Same is true with uh, Wolf Warrior II, since it is partly an account of how Chinese man saves Africans from themselves. Number three, in the Lawrence of Arabia, a British colonel tells the Arabian king Faisal that, quote, quote, British and Arab interests are one and the same, end of the quote. In Wolf Warrior II, as well, it is clearly implied that China's interests are the same as Africa's interests. A slogan which, by the way, was also echoed in Chinese diplomatic discourse, as I will elaborate more fully in a moment. Number four, in the Lawrence of Arabia, you hear, uh, you hear another echo, the echo of so-called the white man's burden. The famous poem composed by Rudyard Kipling in 1899, the poem was intended to legitimize European colonialism after the fact. In Wolf, uh, in Wolf Warrior II, you have what may be called anticipatory legitimation of the Chinese empire. However, in reality, as far as I know, there is no poem which is titled The Yellow Man's Burden. But there is no guarantee that there will not be one in the future. Despite the fact that the solidarity between black peoples and yellow peoples in the modern period, in the modern period was initially based on the experience of being non-white, what is called pigmentational solidarity. It is therefore safe uh, to say that China today has its own Lawrence, but not its own Kipling. Number five. Num number five, uh, patriotism is expressed in both movies in terms of national symbols, such as flags and insignia of the respective uh, militaries. Finally, number six, both Britain and China win in the movies. Apart from the broad similarities which we could see on the screen, how do uh, European empire and Chinese empire in the making compare in reality? How, in other words, how comparable are the external behaviors of European colonial powers in the 19th century and of China today, China in Africa today? It is to these questions I, I will now turn. Uh, so, one difference between European Empire and the new Chinese Empire is that on the one hand, European Empire took the form of territorial annexation. The Chinese Empire, on the other hand, prefers to dominate and control through economic means. Mm -hmm. The Chinese Empire is so anxious to avoid the appearance of annexation 
that it even shuns the idea of constructive engagement, the idea of quote unquote constructive engagement with African countries. Constructive engagement is, in my view, a euphemism for interference in the affairs of other states. In spite of uh, its uh, denial, however, in practice, China is no less interventionist in Africa than the other major powers. We may also assume, given the pattern of behavior of great powers historically, that China's natural impulse towards interference would become stronger as its power and interest expand. As if to underscore this point, Wolf Warrior 2 is partly about how a Chinese PLA hero, PLA that is uh, People's Liberation Army hero, played by Leng Feng, extricates Chinese nationals from a war ravaged unnamed African country. A related distinction is that on the one hand, European colonialism was based on economy of power, meaning relatively limited British military presence in Kenya or Nigeria was often enough to earn the obedience and com compliance of millions of colonized peoples. Only an economy of force could have made it possible for such an island nation as England to build and control an empire on a global scale. The Chinese empire, on the other hand, is predicated on power of economy, mostly through investment and trade. Another difference between the European legacy and the emerging Chinese hegemony is that on the one hand, European imperialism was polycentric, based in London, Paris, Brussels, Lisbon, Rome, and so forth. European powers engaged in competitive imperialism, as it was implied by the phrase, the scramble for Africa. China, on the other hand, is engaged in imperial monopoly. It seeks to build a unicentric empire. So monopolistic does Chinese hegemony aspire to be that it becomes nervous, for instance, about the presumably growing Japanese economic presence in Africa. In fact, Japan's trade with Africa is smaller than Brazil's trade with Africa, even though Japan is the third largest economy after US and uh, China. The fact that Europe today lacks the, cap the capacity and the US lacks the will to counter China in Africa has been an absolute godsend for China. In other words, the U.S. should never expect that it would be invited by China to the Chinese scramble for Africa, as the U.S. was invited but declined to participate in the European scramble for Africa at the Berlin Conference in 1885. Number uh, three, out of 54 African states, in more than half of them, European languages such as English and French are official languages. This linguistic dependency is one of Europe's colonial legacy in Africa. Obviously, China is behind in this respect, and yet its intention is clear, since it has built dozens of Confucius institutes in African countries, whose purpose includes the teaching of Chinese languages and culture. What is less clear is whether Chinese language in Africa will become a communal, communalist language or an ecumenical language. A communalist language defines as communities those who speak the language as a mother tongue or first language. Arabs, for instance, are those to whom Arabic is the first language. An ecumenical language, on the other hand, transcends the boundaries of race and ethnicity. A person did not become English merely by being English speaking. In other words, English language is less racially exclusive compared, for instance, to French. We do not therefore know if Chinese 
ends up becoming a communalist language, or ecumenical language when and if it spreads in Africa. The old, number four, the old European empires in Africa were ultimately based on doctrines of racial gradation, hence the concept of the white man's burden. As of now, there is no Chinese equivalent of the yellow man's burden. The new Chinese empire instead is based on developmental gradation. This does not mean Chinese have no or will have no racial prejudice against Africans. Racism with Chinese characteristics remains a potentially complicating factor in China-Africa relations in the future. We need also to remember uh, that even though China is a newcomer to empire building in a Eurocentric world or system, it had operated a tribute system for centuries. The tribute system was not based on benevolent racism. It was based on benevolent hierarchy. Some may say that the difference between benevolent racism and the benevolent hierarchy is a difference without a distinction. Be that as it may, a benevolent hierarchy which is rooted in Confucianism is the foundation of East Asian civilization. It is true that China was integrated into the European state system in the 19th century, but the desire of China for an alternative system never completely disappeared. For the same reason, one cannot say the idea of a tribute system has been completely erased and does not affect China's diplomacy today. Some of the favorite slogans of Chinese leaders today include quote-unquote win-win relationship and quote-unquote common development which are also reminders of not just the benevolent hierarchy of the tribute system, but also of, quote unquote, harmony of interest, too, which underpinned Japan's Great East Asian Core Prosperity Zone, which was the official name Japan gave to its empire in Asia in the 20th century. Japan began its imperial project under Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Co Zone, primarily for economic reasons. But it was also based in theory on the Confucian concept of benevolent hierarchy. The question which must be asked now is whether what is unfolding in the 21st century is, century is China's version of Greater East Asian Co Prosperity Zone or GEACP 2.0. We must also ask whether GEACPZ under China, when and if it emerges, would not suffer the fate of GEACPZ under Japan. In any case, for now, European civilizing mission seems to be in the process of being replaced by a Chinese development mission. This is in spite of the fact that China sometimes describes itself as a developing country. Objectively, China is the second largest economy in the world, but subjectively, it sees itself as a developing country, both at the same time. Number five, since the European colonization had once consisted of annexation of the territory of the colonies, the imperial power assumed sovereignty of the colonies, sovereignty over the colonies. One ramification of the British flag flying over its colonies was Britain's acceptance of responsibility if anything went wrong there. By being an empire of control rather than annexation, China seeks to absolve itself of any responsibility when things go wrong in places over which it has effective control. Number six, 
National economies are more interdependent today, as you know, than they were uh, 100 years ago. They are also less Eurocentric. We may in fact say that the international system is multipolar in the economic uh, sphere. Number seven. 19th century Europe represented a multipolar international system. Geopolitically, however, what we have today is a unipolar international system in which the US is a preeminent power. And yet China has also made it clear that it would like to see the emergence of a multipolar international system. But historically, the intentions of emerging powers are notoriously inscrutable. We do not therefore know whether or not Chinese leaders mean what they say. In addition, using a Marxist phraseology, we could say, more importantly perhaps, that China makes its own history, but not in circumstances of its own making. Number eight, uh, powerful technologies exist today, unlike in the 19th century which are bound to influence the rise, decline, and fall of great powers. What forms or this influence precisely take is nevertheless hard for us to assess now. Incidentally, a comparison of the Lawrence of Arabia and Wolf Warrior II dramatically shows the technological change in the last 100 years. Uh, in the Lawrence of Arabia, the camel dominates the scene. In uh, Wolf Warrior II, you see many battleships and aircraft carriers. Number nine, colonization of Africa by Europe took place largely by accident, by experience, and by greed. What I mean here is the motive for European expansion in Africa differed from country to country, from locality to locality, even within the same country, and from a period to period. Even such slogans as the white man's burden and civilizing mission represented justifications after the fact rather than a grand plan or strategy. But China appears more organized in this respect. And it clearly has specific plans to integrate different parts of the globe, including Africa and the Middle East, into its economic orbit. Number 10, Chinese empire builders, like Europe's empire builders, share a focus on investment in infrastructure. This is not surprising because roads, railways, and bridges are needed for transporting Africa's raw materials from the hinterland to the outlet to the sea for them to be shipped in turn to Shanghai or Beijing. And finally, the focus on infrastructure is closely connected with and is reflective of the broader, uh, broadly similar structure of economic relationship between, on the one hand, Europe and Africa in the 19th century, and on the other hand, China and Africa in the 21st century. Africa exported primary commodities to Europe and China, and imported manufactured goods. In my attempt to point out the broad similarities between Europe's empire and China's empire in the making, uh, it is possible I have oversimplified the reality to some extent. Additionally, in some areas, China's diplomacy is not only less clear-cut, but, and even more importantly, it is contradictory. And that is uh, what I call China's dual diplomacy in uh, Africa. I use the image of wolf uh, 
I use the image, image of wolf with two faces. Because, number one, I wanted to continue with the metaphor you know, to, to the wolf. And secondly, um, uh, uh, secondly, it seems to me that the wolf may be one of the most favorite animals in China. I'm just guessing. And thirdly, and importantly, uh, some people in Africa look at China as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is the topic I will uh, turn now, uh, China's global diplomacy uh, in Africa. Uh, an element of dualism in China's diplomacy in Africa manifests itself in China's tendency to uh, invest both in resource-rich countries and in countries not yet known for producing or having uh, resources critically important to China. Uh, two weeks ago, for example, uh, President Xi Jinping of China visited Senegal, Rwanda, and Mauritius. In 2016, imports from the three countries Uh, in 2016, imports of the three countries from China was less than US two, less than two billion dollars. US dollars. To put this in a comparative context, US imports from China in 2016 was about 500 billion dollars. <coughs> China is just less selective in its economic diplomacy in Africa uh, because of its immense appetite for natural resources. China is interested in small and poor countries in Africa as well as, as, as well, so long as they possess resources useful to China, even if these resources are not yet fully developed. <coughs> so China has a relationship, strong relationship with resource-rich countries in Africa such as Zambia, South Africa, Angola, Sudan, Nigeria as well as for with countries that do not have resources that are important to China at the moment, including Ethiopia, Rwanda, Mozambique. Secondly, uh, or another manifestation uh, of the duality of China's diplomacy in Africa is the multiplicity of Chinese actors, ranging from the state or Communist Party of China uh, state-owned enterprises, semi-private enterprises, private companies, and individuals. There are multiplicity of actors. Sometimes the objective of these actors contradict. And uh, then there is China's emphasis on um, both bilateralism and multilateralism in its engagement with Africa. China today has diplomatic relations with 53 out of 54 African countries. Swaziland is the only African country that recognizes Taiwan. In addition to one-on-one -on -one relations with African governments on a bilateral basis, China has shown inclinations for diplomatic engagement about African issues with uh, intergovernmental and regional organizations such as the African Union, uh, new, economic de uh, new Economic Partnership for African Development, or NEPAD, and Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS. There is also the issue of China's collaboration with and defiance of the West. China's collaboration with and defiance of the West, both at the same time. China has on occasions acted in tandem with, uh, for instance, the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, United Nations Development Program, Food and Agricultural Organization, and other multilateral institutions on issues relevant to Africa. On other occasions, China has ignored the principles of some of these very institutions. Finally, we have the uh, diplomatic <coughs> duality, which relates to China's contribution to peace and conflict in Africa. In recent years, Chinese personal contribution to the United Nations peacekeeping operation activities in Africa has increased significantly. 
However, China's arms have also contributed directly or indirectly to the perpetuation or in some cases escalation of violent conflicts in places ranging from the Democratic Republic of Congo to South Sudan. China's uh, share of the conventional arms market in Sub-Saharan Africa is quite substantial. According to Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, China's arms exports to Africa increased by 55% between 2013 and 2017, compared to the, the period between uh, 2008 and 2012. So, due to the contradictions in China's diplomacy in Africa, which I just outlined, we have in Africa both Sino-optimists and Sino-pessimists. Sino-optimists see China as a force for good in Africa, which is both capable of and willing to ignite economic modernization on the continent. Sino-pessimists strongly disagree and point out that China in Africa is actually a wolf in sheep's clothing. But when all is said and done, are there no situations when China is a friend of Africa? I argue that there are such situations, situations when China is a friend of Africa. This is the criteria with which we can assess whether China is a friend of Africa or not. Uh, specifically, there are two scenarios in which China could be uh, viewed as a friend of Africa. Number one, it is when China helps to empower African peoples vis-a-vis -vis their governments. And number two, when China helps to empower African states, not necessarily African governments, African states in the international system. So here are the seven domestic scenarios in which China would be a friend of uh, Africa. China is a friend of Africa, number one, when, uh, a friend of Africa when its aid promotes not only economic development but also accountable governments. Number two, China is a friend of Africa when it is more responsive to Africa's humanitarian needs in case of emergency. Number three, China is a friend of Africa when it plays a constructive role by mediating some of the conflicts between and within African states, but without excessive intrusion. Number four, China is a friend of Africa when it takes seriously the idea of prosecuting war criminals and those who have committed crimes against humanity. Number five, China is a friend of Africa when it provides peacekeeping troops under the auspices of the United Nations or regional organizations. Number six, China is a friend of Africa when it encourages genuine inter-ethnic power sharing in Africa. And number seven, China is a friend of Africa when it makes capital and skill transfer to the continent on a massive scale that leads to technological revolution. And here are the three international scenarios under which China becomes a friend of Africa. One is when uh, it helps African states to empower themselves in the global system by supporting them to gain both access to and power in existing or emerging international institutions. Number two, China is a friend when it uh, recognizes that it does not make any sense at all to keep Africa out of the mainstream of international affairs today. And number three, China is a friend of Africa when it recognizes the two scenarios, the two international scenarios I just mentioned, are also consistent with the Chinese vision of a multipolar international system. 
I would like to uh, conclude with uh, three quotations from three individuals, all of whom are dead. The quotations fairly summarize the major points I have tried to make uh, so far. <coughs> I believe you are familiar with some of these individuals. The first quotation from Edward Said, the rhetoric of power, all too easily produces an illusion of benevolence when deployed in an imperial setting. Here, Edward Said was underscoring uh, that an illusion of benevolence is a unifying theme in imperial discourse. In other words, there is such a tradition. Whether the imperialists are the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the French, the British, the Americans, the Japanese, or the Chinese. That is the point he's making. And then there is this quotation from Ali Mazumi. He said, uh, issues concerning the responsibility of the developed towards the underdeveloped are a more modern and less bigoted version of the obligations of the more civilized towards the less civilized. Mazuri's statement reminds us that even though an illusion of benevolence is a common denominator in imperial discourse, its form and emphasis could evolve and change uh, over time. That's also what I uh, try to show in parts of my presentation, the continuity between the imperial discourse of 19th century Europe and China. Then there, here is a quotation from John Lamenas. The sins of the powerful acquires some of the prestige of power. The implication of John Lamenas' observation are wider and timeless in the sense that they apply to human relations in general, whether it is a relationship between China and Africa or relationship between a leader and his supporters and so forth. And uh, there is a reason why I chose this specific quotations from these specific individuals. Uh, one reason being there is some linkage between the three. I know that Ali Mazuri, who died in 2014, and Edward Said, died in 2003, they used to correspond, they know each other, yeah, uh, and they may also share perspectives. And John Plaminat was the supervisor of Ali Mazuri at Oxford University in the 1960s. So this is a, a linkage. Now, um, let me, uh, yeah, of course, the other, other reason I already, I already mentioned is uh, they are relevant to what I've been talking about. Let me close by uh, my presentation by saying a few words about the majestic size of Africa. <laughs> Africa is larger than it is often realized. Occasionally, I ask my students when I teach here in the US, which one is bigger in size, Africa or the US? Many of my students are less sure. Oh. And I asked the same question in China when I used to mm -hmm. teach there. And the response is generally the same. They are less sure. I asked them is, which, which one is bigger, China or Africa? They are not less sure. Africa mm -hmm. truly has a majestic size mm -hmm. that you can see here. Apart from uh, its size, Africa has the largest oil reserve on the planet after the Middle East. It has massive quantities of precious minerals that are needed for high-tech manufacturing, 
55% of the world is diamond, and 22% of gold comes from Africa. Another precious metal, platinum. This is the rarest and most expensive of the popular precious metals, which has multiple industrial use, especially in auto industries. South Africa is the world's largest platinum producer, with more than twice as much as every other country's production combined. Africa also has, as you can see, uh, uh, Africa has substantial arable land, which is either unutilized or underutilized. It has an expanding export market with population which is larger than the population of the US and EU combined. And Africa has enormous need for capital, for energy, and for infrastructure. And as you can see, China is a small landmass compared to the landmass called Africa. So I began my presentation by comparing the 19th century European empire in Africa with the Chinese empire in the making. So I would like to do the same in closing. China's population today is larger than Europe's population in the 19th century, both in absolute and relative terms. Also, Africa is by far larger than China in size. China's population is virtually equal to Africa's population today. Africa and China are all the same population today. This means China today has not only surplus capital, but also surplus population, too, for better or worse. And uh, I'll stop my presentation there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really another tour de force, and it set us out conceptually. Um, I could just like to start off the, um, the question and answer. Please be generous with yourselves to answer questions. As you know, there's no bad questions. Chances are pretty good that someone else may have the same. I'd just like if you went back, one well, this map is spectacular. I mean, we need people to know. Yeah, it's 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 so so <laughs> this is something we need to put in front of our screen. If you would just go up to the quotations in the, the one before this, I think it was. Yeah. Many of you know I'm kind of hung up on how we teach about the world. Mm -hmm. And this second quotation here from Ali Masrui, who is an absolutely remarkable scholar anyway, it drew my attention to the idea of how we teach about the world. We have these courses called Eastern Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere nowadays, yeah. which I don't think are a good way to teach students about the world, especially not when they're sixth and seventh graders and it's the first time they're looking at the world. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have them building sugar cube pyramids and you know knights in shining armor than being introduced to a view of the world that is you know contemporary and has no hint of how we got here from there. And so the second quotation is really crystallizes that default way, and that also includes standalone geography courses as a substitute for world history. Because students wouldn't know how the developed and underdeveloped world got to be the way they are. The most current issue we have right now with AP history is they're cutting the course um, off, whether it's 1450 or 1200 now, they've gone back a little bit. Uh, again, it provides us with only a view of history of, as, as, as it would come into the, to the modern era. And so I think it really short changes, and we need to look at how, how a student's worldview is going to be shaped by this kind of, of, of truncated power. My favorite um, protest about the AP cutting off was, okay, so human anatomy is complicated, so should we only teach it from the waist up? <laughs> <laughs> so I open it for with that to, to questions. Uh, Jihan has a microphone. Thank you very much. In commenting on the integrity of China's interest in Africa, I was wondering if you could comment on Africans in China. A few years ago, over 300 Africans were imprisoned in China because they didn't speak 
Mandarin properly, therefore they couldn't adapt thesis the correct way, and they were imprisoned because of it. They, uh, many Africans moved to China to set up businesses or to set up churches, and because they don't speak the language, they're imprisoned. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about that. All right, uh, Africans in China, right? Uh, yes. There are not really that many Africans in China. Uh, I was teaching in Hong Kong uh, in the, uh, last year in the Fulton, and uh, uh, from Hong Kong I took train and went to Guangzhou, uh, a city known for uh, its large uh, African population, you know, yeah, and, uh, I, I, I was also I mean, able to chat with some of the Africans there, you know, and uh, uh, it seems to me that they are not well integrated into the community, partly because they don't speak the language, you know, yeah. and in China it's also relatively new to internationalization, you know, yeah. it's trying to adjust itself as well, you know, and uh, actually what I saw in that city reminded me of what I saw. In Japan in the 1990s, I was a graduate student there in the early 1990s. That was the time of internationalization in Japan. Uh, uh, so uh, some of the uh, services that are provided to Africans in China resemble the services, you know, we were provided in Japan in the 1990s. You know, when there was some talk, you know, Japan would become a superpower or Japan would share uh, global leadership with U.S. things like that. You know, in fact, I received a scholarship actually because of that internationalization phenomenon. You know, to study in Japan. So uh, that is the broad similarity I see, you know, between Africans in China uh, and Africans in uh, in, in Japan. But you know, as I said, uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon. Probably there are more Chinese in Africa than there are Africans in China. And, uh, but I have to admit that I am an expert on this, and uh, I know Professor Park will be speaking on uh, maybe a topic related to this. She, she definitely knows more than I do on this topic, uh, about this topic. Thank you. Question here. Um, so I'm just curious, um, with the recording that's being done in the port in Sri Lanka, I was wondering, like, has that impacted what you've noticed in terms of countries' attitudes towards investment from China into some of this infrastructure and the idea that it could kind of turn into a possible land takeover? I mean, maybe not. I don't think it's necessarily that bad in Sri Lanka, but it is an interesting question about yeah, it. Is, what, is, what, in uh, terms of is, It is a very interesting question, actually. When I heard the news, you know, what came to my mind was, you know, this distinction I made between imperialism of conquest you know, and so forth. In fact, you know, the, what is happening in Sri Lanka, uh, as well as you know, I think in Burma to some extent, mm -hmm. is that China maybe, uh, China seems to be behaving more 19th century European colonial powers than, you know, some of the things I described here, you know, but still it is too early to tell, you know, whether that is just a separate, isolated event, or it's going to be a trend, you know, we don't know. But uh, that is a very uh, important question, you know, yeah, we, we wait and see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to talk about exporting surplus labor. My first question has to do with the words with which you um, finished the presentation. You were talking about China exporting a lot of surplus labor um, to the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, you alluded to it a little bit in your paper as well. I'm interested, is this seen as um, a national strategy in the part of China of sort of dealing with domestic unemployment? Um, by exporting it, and how are African countries um, leaders dealing with it in terms of desiring sort of 
the level of education and technical expertise to be more homegrown. Okay. Yeah, uh, Africa's response to China is completely uncoordinated, mm -hmm. you know, and that is very good for China because China deals with each African country rather than, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with Africa as a whole. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I mentioned the surplus population, and uh, I, I, I was just suggesting that, you know, since the population of China today is larger uh, than the population of Europe in the 19th century, you know, and uh, I mean, China is very crowded, you know, country mm. as well, you know, yeah. And uh, if there would ever be a settler colonialism in Africa, that would be a, uh, a very um, difficult phenomenon, I mean, uh, to cope with in Africa, you know. Uh, and having been in China, I mean, actually, I saw the uh, movie Wolf Warriors too, in Shanghai last year. Having been in China and Hong Kong, you know, when you see how crowded the place is, you know, yeah. I see no reason why China would not be interested in moving its part of the surplus population to Africa, you know, if possible. You know, yeah, and uh, there is a book by Howard French, if you have uh, heard, uh, uh, it's titled China's Second Continent, you know, yeah, and in that book he does address these issues, you know, uh, and, uh, but again, uh, it is uh, too early uh, to say, and also depends on what happens in China itself, you know, and uh, also uh, what happens in Africa, what happens internationally, what happens in the U.S., you know, so forth. So there are so many variables, you know, yeah. Almost, sure. not really a follow-up, actually. In your conclusion, you talk about the Yeah, uh, at the moment, you know, in Africa, you have what is called sino optimism. Generally, people are very have favorable attitude towards China. Not only African governments, but African peoples in general. You know, yeah. And uh, so, and, and Chinese, of course, say that you know they are unlike European colonial powers. They are not, you know, they have no colonial intention and so and so forth. But the thing is that, you know, uh, capital has also its own logic. You know, yeah, there are things, you know, which Chinese leaders could do and could not do. You know, even if China is uh, a benevolent power, you know, and wants to do the right thing. But, uh, I mean, one doesn't have to be a Marxist to say that, you know, capital has its own logic, you know, whether the capitalist is European or Chinese. You know, that's what I'm saying. And therefore, it is very likely that you know this relationship of dependency would continue with Africa as well. And I see the, no no difference in that in that respect. You know, yeah. And uh, so when I talked about the intention of African leaders as well as Chinese leaders, you know, we have to be skeptical. You know, yeah. Because number one, uh, there is no way of saying whether what they are saying is really what they believe in. And secondly, also there are limits to what they could do. You know, on both sides. Yes. Um, my question is this. I was curious because you shared also in the conclusion of your presentation about the many resources um, that Africa has. Um, my question is, and I guess I'm asking because I'm looking from the outside in, um, with all these resources and since and when Great Britain, of course, um, released influence from, the, from having the colonies in Africa, what did you, from your perspective, why has Africa, in certain certain nations within Africa, have had difficulty in progression um, with their economies? And when you, and the second part of my question does deal with China. Um, are there some African nations that are nations that have turned to a more isolationist policy? Um, because one of the things we see this in our country, but we also, and I went to Berlin. In Europe, there are um, individuals who have desired for even certain nations within Europe to become more isolationist. So I was just curious about that, just from the African perspective. Okay, thank you very much. You touched on many points, and uh, let me try to answer some of them. Uh, 
uh, uh, first of all, uh, as you may know, there are two uh, schools of thought about why Africa was not successful in economic modernization. One is the dependency school, you know, which says that Africa was not modern, has not modernized uh, because of exploitation. You know, yeah, the global north you know, exploits global south. And Africa is part of the global South, you know, and uh, so. Uh, but especially after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and of communism, the uh, dependency school has become less popular, you know. And then you have the modernization school, you know. Yeah. According to it, Africa was not successful because it didn't uh, implement or adopt and implement the right policies, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so these are, these are the two broad explanations for the state of uh, Africa today. Uh, and my own position is that it is a combination of both. You know, yeah, in the way the international economic system is structured, is not very favorable. And also uh, Africa has leadership problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, I forgot the other question. Mm -hmm. That's all or? Well, what I had asked was deal with isolationism. If, 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 if there are some countries in Africa who see maybe, like, you know, with, for example, what's happening in the United States, you know, with fear of, of different immigrants and individuals coming into a country, somewhere even Europe, of course, is experiencing this. I was wondering if, with some of the Chinese coming in, coming into Africa, if there is individuals and governments who were like what we want isolationism as opposed to you know interconnectedness. Uh, right. I mean that may become a problem in the future, you know, yeah. And I think I did suggest that as well in my presentation. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, you know, uh, 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 we are at early stage of this relationship, right? Just okay. about two, two decades, you know, and so forth. But when people to start to interact more regularly, you know, yeah then you could see different types of uh, reactions. Okay, thank you. I'm fascinated by your comparative approach. I think it's very helpful, so thank you. Um, number two, I'm, I'm also interested in your pointing out the competitive nature of European national competition in their imperial acquisition of different regions in Africa. And I'm wondering, is there a regional competition or a national competition on some African nations today to further their relationships with China? All right. Uh, the short answer is unfortunately no. No uh, regional competition. You know, uh, in Africa, as I said, at the moment, the, the trend is pro-China. You know, yeah. Partly because some of the in Africa have bought into the Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese uh, 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 propaganda, you know, that they are different from the West and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, also partly because Chinese have brought, you know, a lack of transparency, things like that, you know, given many of Africa's governments are not accountable governments, not elected, you know. It's good for African governments, not African peoples. That's why I try to make uh, the distinction between African governments and African states, you know, yeah, and uh, Chinese support to Africa should help not only uh, 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 economic development, you know, but also accountable governments. Mm -hmm. you know, that is what is lacking, and uh, that's also what I meant when I referred to bad governance in, in Africa, you know, yeah, and uh, of course there is no unity in Africa in spite of the fact that there is an organization called African Union, yeah. Yeah, and uh, this is very, very good for China. And mm -hmm. also, as I mentioned, that it seems Europe lacks the capacity and the US lacks the willingness to counter China in Africa. And that is another uh, factor. I, I'll, I'll take the mic, so we're recording here. Good morning, thank you. Um, I was in South Africa and I was stunned by all the signs I saw, learn Chinese today, learn Chinese today. And so my question is, I have a two-part question. One, where are the Chinese in Africa primarily? Like just if you could list maybe the three top countries. And two, um, as the Chinese have entered Africa, have they had to navigate any interesting racial, cultural waters as they've learned to conduct business with 
Africans, I especially think of the legacy of apartheid in South Africa, what issues might have caught them by surprise, or how have they negotiated sort of the complex racial cultural histories of Africa to do business effectively? No, I'm sorry, that is the second part. Of how have they negotiated uh, the complex waters of you know the racial cultural past of Africa, if necessary? I don't know if it's necessary to to create transactions to have effective business with the Africans. And especially when I think of the apartheid may be over, but the, the legacy of apartheid is still very present in the way people groups are treated, mixed versus colored versus Asians. And so, you know, what kinds of things have they had to learn to make a successful go at business is what I'm asking. Okay, th thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, as far as statistics, statistics, I don't have uh, uh, figures with me, but I understand that there are many Chinese in South, in South Africa, for example, as well as in Nigeria. Uh, but uh, again, you know, uh, Professor Park may know more about this than I do. You know, yeah, who's going to speak here? Uh, your second question, which is broader, uh, is uh, that you know I think uh, this phenomena is phenomena of you know, enhanced Sino-African relationship is new to China, as it is new to Africa. You know, yeah. and, uh, and Africa today is, no, sorry, China today is very different from China of the 1960s, when it used to support national liberation movements you know, and things like that. And uh, so uh, it, it seems to me that, you know, uh, Chinese leaders are as less prepared to deal with this uh, new phenomena as African countries are uh, because we are in new territory. You know, in the past, you know, Sino-African relationship was based on what I call pigmentational solidarity, solidarity of being non-white, and also uh, the solidarity of being victims of colonialism, being victims of imperialism, and so on and so forth. And uh, with the end of communism, you know, some of those foundations have disappeared. You know, yeah. And uh, now China is, you know, uh, China is in Africa mainly for economic reasons, not for ideological reasons, as that mm -hmm. was the case in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this new role, both especially for China, has uh, brought about uh, new relations. You know, and uh, so. Uh, this is obviously a work in progress, you know, both the imperial project of China, what I call imperial project of China, and my work about that is also work in progress. So that is my answer in short term. Okay. Yes. Is, is that part of the wolf in sheep's clothing kind of <laughs> image that you used, that, that you know, China was supportive of national liberation movements and the whole racial solidarity thing? Is that Part of it, you think? Yeah, yes, yeah, it is related. You know, uh, it is related in the sense that uh, China's identity has changed, right? Yeah, China now, China is now in Africa as uh, aspiring superpower. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, not as uh, just for solidarity. You know, anti-colonial solidarity. So, uh, even though I do not really subscribe to the school of thought, which sees China as a wolf in, as, as, as a wolf in ships closing, you know, yeah, because that would imply that China really knows what it is doing. In fact, <laughs> China itself doesn't really know, you know, yeah, uh, uh, but we don't know, I mean, uh, Chinese do say that, you know, they are there in Africa for common, I mean, for uh, Africa, you know, uh, to help Africa and uh, to develop together, you know, and that is what the Japanese also said, you know, when they invaded, you know, Southeast Asia, including China as well. So, uh, I mean, this, the outcome will remain, I mean, uh, to be seen. Uh, and, uh, yes. Excuse me, I, I, well, can you just speak, I, I stepped out of the room, so maybe you can The mic, we need the mic to do that. Can you just pass the mic? We have two, I think. Uh, apropos, can you just speak to uh, recent allegations about uh, about uh, corruption in terms of Chinese investment in 
um, in Africa. I'm sorry to, to broach that subject, but I'd just be interested in what you have to say about that. Corruption in Africa. In, Where, in, in Chinese, Chinese Africa. Africa. Ah, Chinese corruption in Chinese Muslim. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that is the, also what I meant when I said, you know, uh, uh, to, when I refer to the tran lack of transparency. You know, yeah. When there's lack of transparency, of course, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that creates room for corruption, you know. And uh, this is uh, one of the factors that attract some African leaders, you know, toward China, you know, and uh, and China. And uh, but as I uh, pointed out in my presentation, in the long term, this is not even in China's interest. You know, yeah, in the long term, having accountable, legitimate governments are good for China too. If it is interested in long term, stable relationship with. Uh, uh, African countries, you know, and yes, I mean there is corruption, but nobody even knows the extent of that corruption, you know, because it is not uh, business is not done in a transparent way. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have answered your question, but uh, in general, that's what I have to say. You have a follow up, or no. okay? Yeah. Um. Isn't there any more uh, the competition between Russia uh, and China, China right now uh, in Africa? Because like in the 1950s, early 60s, the Russian influence, the Russian communist influence in Africa is, was stronger than now. So uh, uh, Russia is stopping uh, the, its influence in Africa or what? More Chinese stronger right now? Yeah, yes, China is stronger. In, uh, I mean, Russia is just pretending to be what it was. I mean, uh, China, uh, of course, as you said, it was a hard, great influence in Africa, especially, I mean, Soviet Union, the former Soviet yeah, so, Union. Yes, right? yes, that's what And I there mean. was also competition between the Soviet Union and right. China, you know, yeah, uh, including during what was called the Sino-Soviet split, you know, China supporting some national liberation movements, the Soviets supporting others, and so forth. But uh, China, the Soviet Union, or Russia, you know, today, uh, is not really a major player in Africa. You know, yeah. I don't think Russians are aspiring for uh, uh, global hegemony in the way the Chinese are. You know, for that reason, uh, I don't think you know, China, uh, Russia would pose any major challenge okay. to China in Africa. I, uh, at least this is my personal observation. Of Chinese influence, it's not only in Africa or whatever, I would say that it is global. And uh, I think this uh, derives from two things. First, because their population. And then the second is because of their industrial mentality. Because if you go anywhere in the world, I went to Ecuador, for example. If I want to eat rice because I'm Asian, I would just find I would just find Chinese restaurant, not any other Arabic because they don't always have rice, for example. But Chinese restaurant is closer to my food. And also, you find made in China everywhere in the world. So I think these two, their population and then their industrial nature in business. Right, that's right. China is unlike. <laughs> European powers, you know, yeah, like the European colonial powers. It's also unlike the U.S., you know, in many ways, you know, yeah. And uh, so for that reason, you know, uh, we are going to see different things, you know, I mean, uh, things that are very different from what we are used to, you know, and uh, uh, so. Yeah. 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 Yeah.